The title of this article is Timing Matters, The Effects of Protein Intake Timing on Resistance Training Outcomes. The main author here is Lack at All, and this was published in 2024 in Frontiers of Nutrition. And so let's dive in here. So introduction-wise, resistance training combined with sufficient protein intake is essential for growing muscles, for hypertrophy, and for also strength. But there's also lots of training variables like volume, intensity, and frequency to optimize muscle growth. However, there's different protein intake variables as well, meaning the total daily protein intake, protein distribution throughout the day, the timing relative to exercise, all these things that people pontificate about all the time on the internet. But however, the current consensus is that anything up to about 1.6 grams per kilogram per day has effects and anything above that doesn't really lead to better gains in hypertrophy or strength, specifically hypertrophy we're looking at here, but about 1.6 grams per kilogram per day. That's what you'll see everyone in line talking about. We got to get that. We got to get that. It doesn't necessarily show you have to get there. They're saying when you get to above that it doesn't necessarily have better improvements. And so you can actually have less than that and still make gains. That's kind of the nuance there, but that's what we're looking at here. And the study here, We've had previous studies that have provided mixed results regarding the optimal timing of protein intake for hypertrophy. Existing meta-analyses showed inconsistent findings due to lack of controls or different methodologies. And what they do is they'd give one group protein but didn't give the same amount to anyone else or any protein at all to the control group. So it was kind of difficult. So the, the whole goal of this study was to compare the effects of immediate versus delayed, meaning right after exercise or three hours before or after exercise. So they're immediate versus delayed protein intake on body composition and performance in resistance trained males. So moving to the methods, the participants here, we had 40 um, resistance trained males. So they've on average been exercising for a while. They're used to this. They're about 24 plus or minus four years. They train three or more times per week for a year. So they've been lifting for a while here. They can't use steroids or any of their supplements Um, no medical issues, and they have consistent sleep, and their protein intake currently is less than two grams per kilogram per day. And in the final sample, we supposed to have 40, we got 31. That's what happens because we had a couple of dropouts. And this was a randomized controlled trial. So this is kind of our gold standard here. The participants were divided into two groups. One was the immediate protein intake group. So pre and post exercise, they pretty much had protein right before and right after exercise. And then we had the delayed protein intake group, which took protein three hours before and after exercise. And from a protein supplementation, the participants consumed about two grams per kilogram per day with 50 grams as whey protein concentrate during their training days. And we had a bunch of things measured on them, right? Right, Body composition, they're looking at skeletal mass, um, fat mass, and BMI. They looked at performance metrics like strength, specifically one rep max, endurance, vertical jump height, and Australian pull-ups were essentially inverted rows. When I saw Australian pull-ups, I was like, what are those? They're inverted rows. They looked at biochemical markers as well, looking at liver function, things like AST, ALT, GGT, which we've talked about before, kidney markers, creatinine, urea, and lipid profile, HDL, LDL, cholesterol. So they looked at a bunch of different things. Specifically, how did they randomize? So they used something called a block randomization approach, and that was to ensure that we had a balanced distribution. A match pair design was implemented based on baseline skeletal muscle mass. So what they kind of did is they kind of matched people. So you had a baseline skeletal mass. We want you to be compared to this other person who's kind of similar. So they really kind of went far into this thing. It wasn't just like this group, that group, they kind of got granular with it as well, which is kind of cool. And from a training program perspective, I also thought this was really cool. They did a non-linear periodization model and they had about four or five resistance training sessions per week, depending on their history and whatnot. So the four day protocol had an upper and lower body focus. Um, this was given to people who generally did before the study less than 20 sets per week. And then they had a five day protocol, which added an additional upper body training day for participants with higher training volume. So if they had greater than 20 sets per week, per week, they were uh, at their baseline. They're doing I think this is really cool. The program design was subject specific and that's awesome. We need more of this, a generic program that's given to someone maybe way too much or too little for someone. And this kind of gives the opportunity to get the best shot at getting results. Cause that's really what we want, right? And in this program, we did about eight to 15 reps with a RIR, so reps in reserve of one to two for each set. So they're definitely working hard there, right? The end of each set, you're getting one or two, meaning you have only one or two reps left left in the tank. That's working pretty hard. And it was supervised by a certified strength and conditioning specialist to make sure that everything was going on there. And then the protein supplement protocol, participants consumed whey protein concentrate. They gave 25 grams pre and 25 grams post. And the timing of it was the big factor we're looking at, right? So non-training days though. So that was on training days, non-training days, protein intake derived from dietary sources with guidance from a dietitian. And they tried to eat about four to seven times per day with 20 to 40 grams of protein per meal to optimize muscle protein synthesis. So a pretty well thought out study. I think it's pretty cool looking through it, trying to compare people. And I, yeah, overall it's really, really cool. So at the end of the day, what they, you know, body composition wise, what do they do for that? 
They took measurements of the body composition pre and post. They used bioelectrical impedance. They used a specific you know, machine there to look at skeletal muscle mass, fat-free mass, and BMI. And overall, you know, this is one of those things where biological impedance is where you use electricity to kind of run through and estimate what's going on. And they they step on a, this machine and you have to be, you know, hydrated, fasted overnight, all that stuff, avoiding caffeine, alcohol, all that stuff. And overall, biological impedance is relatively high reliability, but it's not quite the gold standard like a DEXA is. But at the end of the day, this is what they use. So it's what we got. From a strength and performance assessment, the maximal strength, they did a one rep max test for leg press and chest press following um, just kind of general NSCA, so National Strength and Conditioning Association guidelines. Participants underwent familiarization with the testing protocol, so they made sure they're feeling good about the leg press and chest press, and then they did it. And then they also did a muscular endurance test, which conducted using the leg press and chest press machine at about 75% of what their one rep max was um, to assess their endurance capacity. They kind of did as many as they possibly could. And then they did maximum reps until technical failure. And then they also tested a couple other things like vertical jump height and then the Australian pull-ups is what we mentioned. For blood tests, they also did a bunch of different things, as I mentioned before, taking pre and post intervention after fasting, markers are analyzed, and we mentioned the ones we, we got before. So moving on to the results here. Results, the 31 participants completed the eight-week intervention. The baseline characteristics were comparable between groups with no significant differences. From a body composition changes for skeletal muscle mass, it increased significantly in both groups in both the immediate and delayed protein intake. For uh, fat mass and BMI, there were no significant changes observed. Biochemical markers, urea levels increased significantly in both groups because increased protein metabolism. So urea is a classic thing you'll see on labs for people with a lot of protein. Urea numbers will be up. Um, they observed no significant changes, though, in the markers. From a muscular performance perspective, strength gains, there were significant improvements in leg press and chest press in both groups. And endurance performance, there were significant increases in Australian pull-ups, while other metrics remained stable. Next, let's talk about training volumes. So both groups showed similar training volume throughout the intervention with no significant time or group interactions. Um, from a protein intake and dietary assessment compliance, um, the protein intake increased significantly in both groups, reaching that targeted 2 grams per kilogram per day. Carbohydrate and fat, they were maintained within acceptable micronutrient ranges. Um, they said, hey, keep your macros relatively good. There's kind of a range of what you could get for your carbs and fat, and they kept it there. And it was monitored throughout the uh, whole study with the dietitian and food tracking apps as well. And the key findings here, there was no significant difference between immediate and delayed protein intake. And the main conclusion here is that total daily protein intake is the most critical factor for muscle growth, regardless of intake timing. And the implications for this is that this kind of supports that the idea that the, the quote unquote anabolic window is broader than we previously thought, right? Lasting several hours. So you don't need to slam down a protein shake immediately. And it seems like training adherence and consistency of protein intake and your physical fitness and lifting, those things were key drivers of muscle hypertrophy and performance. So sticking to a program, getting enough protein in general, that's the biggest thing. And I think this is cool is, you know, a lot of times people think of, you know, you see people drinking the protein shakes while they're working out or right after you have to have it. And that's not wrong. You can definitely do that, but it just goes to show here you can be more flexible in that. You have a bigger window of the anabolic window, so you don't have to run home and slam a protein uh, shake necessarily right away. There were some limitations. Obviously, this is only an eight-week study. It may not capture long-term differences. They did use bioelectrical impedance, like I mentioned before, instead of DEXA, so we could have maybe some slight body composition change that we couldn't quite pick up, but the fact that we used the same thing for both makes it feel better about that. Um, there was some variability between participants. There's different differences maybe in their training history, fitness level, and genetics could all affect things as well. And kind of going into conclusions though, is high protein diets significantly enhance muscle performance and skeletal muscle mass in resistance trained males, irrespective of timing. And the big takeaway from here is focus on achieving sufficient daily protein intake rather than stressing over precise timing. And how does this change anything for me? Well, like this is already on my radar, um, kind of that's what I've been seeing in the literature. And so nothing really groundbreaking. However, it's just another piece of evidence that hyper optimization isn't necessary. Get enough protein and you'll be good enough. By far and away, the most important point is to intake enough protein throughout the day. That's the biggest thing. And train hard, right? That's the biggest thing. These people trained hard. It was RII one to two, meaning one or two reps in reserve. They're going hard in their sets. This isn't just, hey, doing a couple there. If you want to have these gains, then you have to push it. And that's really it. what the big thing is. And it's really not that hard. That's the biggest thing. I, that's why I really like this study. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad that my biases are being confirmed <laughs> once again. I know it's bad, um, but obviously I'll, I'll change my mind if things, if things come up. But really like hyper optimization of everything is just really not that important. Unless you're like 
an elite athlete, if you're an elite athlete where every single thing matters and that can be your edge and that can get you a million dollar contract, I get that. Then, hey, we got to nerd up. But here it's like, hey, I want to get stronger and I want to get bigger. Okay, what does it say? Work hard, lift heavy things, get enough protein throughout your day. Like that's really what it comes down to. It's it's that simple. You know, worrying about perfect this and perfect diet and perfect supplement this and there. Like that's not necessary. I think the data keeps continuing to show that, that just be consistent in your training and consistent with what you eat and you should be good. And going forward, I'd love to see more of this just to kind of corroborate it or maybe, you know, call it into question. I'm not sure. I'd love to see though the impact of protein timing in different populations, whether that's older adults or untrained individuals. And then it'd be cool if we did this study with the decks. I think it could be helpful. But overall, I thought this was a really cool study. Once again, I would like to reiterate, and I wanted this to portray to, to people listening that, hey, focus on the big things, right? I talk about big rocks all the time. Big rocks are nutrition and resistance training when it comes to hypertrophy and strength. Do the big things. Don't worry about the small things and you'll be good. And if you enjoyed this segment on the podcast, click right here because YouTube thinks you might like this as well.